Progressive presents Get Pumped. Inspiration to help you do insurance stuff. Okay, time out. You're going to let your budget be the boss of you? Take control with Progressive's Name Your Price tool. Tell us what you want to pay for car insurance, and we'll help you find options that fit your budget. Here's some music to get you pumped. Da -dum -da -dum -da -dum -da -dum -dang -dang. I hear your budget laughing at you. Oh, wait, that's just those kids laughing at me. Ignore them! Da -dum -da -dum -da -dum. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. Radio.com, and I'm your host, Sharon. Yeah, who am I? Get a care lesson with Karen, Christine, Patrick, and Britt Shepard. And we are here today talking about the Star Trek paradigm. Karen, are you there? Karen, can you hear me? Britt, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> I can hear you now. Okay, great. <laughs> Somebody's calling me. I'll, I'll send them to the voicemail. Okay. <laughs> so today uh, we're talking about the Star Trek paradigm. And Karen, you came up with the concept for the show, but it's quite uh, appropriate because it's the 50-year anniversary this year. Uh, coming up in a few, about a month, is the... Uh, I think it's September 6, 1966. I should look that up. Was the first show of Star Trek. Do you want to tell our listeners a little bit more about, about your concept for today's show? And I'm going to look up the day that Star Trek started. Okay, yeah, I'll just go ahead and read the intro. Uh, most people who enjoy science fiction stories don't know that many of the creators of the stories were experiencers, contactees, or were given classified material from government to disclose in a fictional format. Since the early days of TV, the programs were used for soft disclosure, getting the populace ready to engage with extraterrestrial life and the paradigm galactic. Our panel discusses the Star Trek franchise and how it has put ideas out there, despite all the violence for the sake of adventure, it shows us an interesting, positive view of our future, or potential future. So that was kind of my idea. I've been a Star Trek fan for a really long time, since I was a very little kid. It really influenced me. I, I was especially appreciated Mr. Spock, because... I don't know. I have an Irish family. I've got a, a lot of volatile family members that had tempers. I thought Mr. Spock was really cool because he kept himself <laughs> cool and collected and uh, was logical, and I thought that was pretty cool. So I was really influenced by it. And, oh, my gosh, now that uh, my, my grandson's my age when it started, um, we've had so many shows, so many movies, and, and a very interesting view for our future and uh, be glad to talk to everybody about that today. Excellent. And Brett, how you doing? What was your early Star Trek life like? How did it influence oh, I'm, you? I'm doing great. Um, yes, I, I well, I, I I started watching Star Trek as a little kid. You know, I guess reruns or whatever. Um, it, it what was what was fresh when I was growing up was the Brady Bunch and stuff and. And also reruns, you know. So I, I got a lot of Star Trek, and I watched um, Outer Limits and Twilight Zone and all that, you know. And I loved uh, what Gene Roddenberry was putting out, and I I thought it was um, I thought it was the way the world really was, you know, when I was a kid and I was watching Star Trek. Mm -hmm. And I, I it, to my surprise, it's not that way exactly, except for it is. So science fiction is really science fact in the underbelly of the way the Earth really is. You know, and it's sort of, uh, I, I, I sort of came to that awareness, you know, later on in life, of course, you know, because you're, 
when you're a kid, you know, um, everything's real to you. Batman and Robin and Star Trek and everything, you know. <laughs> and <laughs> but yes, I, Batman I, was on at that time too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, but I, I loved I loved um, all of the Star Trek series. You know, I I, I grew up on that, um, and I grew up on the old ones. They didn't have the new ones yet. Um, mm-hmm. Not till later, you know. And they were they were um they were I think something everyone grew up with, especially, you know, that that were watching um the reruns on the old Zenith t- TVs, you know, with the big knobs that go click, mm-hmm. click, 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 you know. And you have to switch to UHF and VHF, remember those? Uh you know, it's great, um, great, yeah. Yeah, they didn't have very many uh, channels to watch or something, you know. And I, I remember when I was, I was watching kid, it in the Chicago area. Yeah. yeah, when I was a kid, they only had three networks, CBS, NBC, and ABC. And then they had right. the um, educational uh, PBS, and that's it. That's all there was. I'm old. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's all they had. <laughs> that's all they had. <laughs> now we have hundreds of channels. <laughs> we have hundreds yeah. of channels, and we're still watching Star Trek. And they so have I, a new series coming. Um, yeah, I so think that's that's wonderful. That. You know, we're still still watching Star Trek to this day on Hulu. You know. Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, I started <laughs> with Star Trek in nineteen. It was eight, nineteen sixty six, and I was twelve years old. And um, I had uh, it was very exciting. I had grown up with the Beatles, so they they landed in. Uh, right around my birthday, February of night, uh, when I was 10 years old. So that was 1964, they came to America. So still so, uh, right in the Beatle mania, here comes a, these ads for the upcoming television show, which had, of course, Leonard Nimoy, who had his Beatle haircut, and he had ears. <laughs> and um, I was just so excited. I literally... When the, when the show premiered, I sat on my the edge of my bed. I put the TV at the foot of my bed. I, I had I'm one of those spoiled kids and had a TV in my room. I wasn't going to watch this with the parents. I I invited a couple of my friends over, and when the commercial would break, I would literally just scream and and jump up and down on the bed and it's like, okay, wait, go ahead, get back. <laughs> and um, you know. Uh, I was just a uh, maniac Just adored the show And I don't know how many of you know But the very first tier In the first show wasn't all that great Because it was the one about the, the It was about a monster And I thought coming into it That oh we're going away from monsters And they had this monster Let me see if I can get what was the title What was the title of the first show um, It was monster, the man trap The man trap we just watched it on Hulu. Yeah, the, the man trap, and then then the cage. Star Trek. Yeah, the the uh, the cage was actually a two parter. Later on, was originally in black and white. It it did not star William Shatner, believe it or not. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we we got to see the various. Uh, so let me see. You're saying the here's the list of the original show that was called the Man Trap. Why was it called the man trap? Because you know the monster trapped people. It, it ate the salt from people. It was a salt sucker, yes, a salt sucker. And it was so, a shapeshifter. So it would get close to people by being their wife or their husband or their friend. Oh, so they would that's be right. lured. Yeah. They were lured. And you just watched that. <laughs> Great. Yeah, we we just anyway. got Hulu. We're watching we're watching all the shows in order from the beginning just to get that feel again, you know, because uh, you know we we want you know I've just we've talked a lot you and I about Star Trek and and you know I wanted to just go back and you know I, when I was young I don't even remember really the first season I didn't get into it till later so that was this has been fun. right great there it is the Man Trap it, it premiered at eight thirty on September eighth nineteen sixty six. You're right. Uh, I, I just want to say, uh, let's see, there were also these incredible writers at the time. Let's see, did I get that? 
Uh, of course, it was Gene Roddenberry, Harlan Ellison, Theodore Sturgeon, uh, D.C. Fontana, David Gerald, Jerome Bixby, and Norman Spinrad. I know that uh, all the the Harlan, Theodore, D.C. Fontana, they've all gone on, on to write other science fiction, and they, uh, Harlan and Theodore were award-winning science fiction writers, and uh, my husband, ironically, got, I didn't, I didn't make this connection to right now, he, when I met Sasha, Dr. Listen, he said he had studied writing for eight years under the tutelage of Theodore Sturgeon, so there, there's just one wow. of the Star Trek connections. <clears throat> yeah, they also, I don't think they um, also had guests. Uh, they had guest writers. Yeah, they had guest writers come in from the science fiction genre, which was completely unheard of because most shows had a cadre of writers, usually people that would write a western one week and a romance soap opera the next week. And Star Trek was breaking ground of having guest uh, uh, writers, uh, and some of the best mm-hmm. episodes were from guest writers. Yeah. Yeah, so that they, was uh, they had all these, uh, and, and they were um, across the board. You know, they had different people of different races and nationalities in starring roles. Besides the, the crew itself, they would have guests. I remember uh, noticing that, you know, it's like it wasn't very frequently you would have people of different races on television shows, especially back in the 60s. But, um they have the concept that not only do we have other species, but we have other races in, and um, people of color and variations in, you know, leadership roles. So that was, that helped us shift, majorly, majorly shift from the paradigm that um, everybody in television is white to there's all these different colored people, and yes, they can be starship captains and generals. <sighs> And uh, you know, and admirals and all kinds of things. So that was lovely as well to see that. Okay, found on Wikipedia for listeners. If you want to go look at Wikipedia, it has all the different episodes. And back in those days, I let's see how many original shows there were. Seventy nine shows. So now you're lucky if you get a season that has you know a dozen shows, right? Back in those oh, days, yeah, it, it would help. Yeah, they went longer than it was expected, actually, because they were, it was such a different concept for radio at the time. Radio, I mean, excuse me, television at the time was dominated by variety shows like Carol Burnett, Red Skelton Show, all the stuff my parents watched, right? (laughs) Uh Uh Lawrence Welk. You know, it was really, really dominated by that and, and also soap operas, soap operas and then westerns. So that was one of the ways that Gene Roddenberry pitched the story was it was wagon train to the stars. Uh, So he Mm -hmm. was kind of making it similar to the Wild West. You found an awful lot of uh, the characters, the main characters, as well as other characters, came over from Westerns, uh, Gunsmoke most notably, uh, shared actors, Mm -hmm. and uh, Mission Impossible. The show Mission Impossible, of course, shared uh, Leonard Nimoy, uh, and also, let's see, I think Twilight Zone, because Shatner was seen on Twilight Zone, and then he ends up coming over. He's a Canadian actor. He ended up coming over. So it's interesting where, you know, how it evolved. And Brett and I have talked quite a bit about, when we were watching these early episodes, how remarkable, what a remarkable role of, of all people was Lucille Ball, Lucy. She no, was a powerhouse. Amazing. Yeah, she's a powerhouse producer, and hardly any uh, production company would take it on, but she just saw something in the idea of it. And one of the complaints she always had about Hollywood is they always had the same writers all the time. And so she saw them gathering a newer group of writers and reaching out for some guest writers, and I think she was very excited about that because that was her big complaint. She said you should fire the whole lot of them and hire new ones because the, the plots were repetitious and whatnot. And um, she she and her husband had Desilu Studios, and, the, and it was a monster to show because it was almost like a movie um, every time they made it because they had to make everything from mm-hmm. scratch. I mean, they had a, a spaceship, and then they had to go to planets, and then they had to meet aliens, and then they had to go to alien planets with weird landscapes. I mean, 
you know, if you were shooting a Western, all you got to do is run around the California desert and you're good. You know, go to a ghost town and right, you, right. you backdrop, yeah. right? So they, it, you know, I read that there's a wonderful book called The Making of Star Trek. It, it, when I became a Trekkie or Trekker, I got that book and read it cover to cover many times. And these are some of the things that I remembered. And I just thought it was very interesting how it even got started, how it even, you know, was able to even happen at all. And so I think, you know, the censors and the regular television producers and the networks, we're pretty heebie-jeebie about it. It's amazing it lasted as long as it did, but I think it was just too darn popular. And its popularity uh, grew in the reruns. I think if, if they wouldn't have had reruns, um, then it would not have grown. And also there was a, a situation right there technically, and Brett and I talk about you know digital imaging all the time, where some shows were filmed in one technology that where the films deteriorated, okay, um, I don't know who it was, insisted that be, they be filmed in a bit higher level. And so, therefore, we had literally film. okay? So they were filmed like a mm-hmm. movie was, which was also unheard of. As a result, we had pristine copies of it. And it was when the, it, the, film, the movies, or excuse me, the TV shows that had been filmed this way were able to go into reruns and become this huge syndicate market as the years rolled on. So part of the reason why Star Trek continued is because of the forethought of the people producing it to pre- preserve it. Because if it would not have uh-huh. been preserved, it would not have continued either. So there's some very interesting technical reasons why we still have all of that with us today. Um, but it, but it just was, you know, it, it, for like Brett and I were saying, we grew up with it. You know, I, I, of course, we didn't have, my dad was the last guy in the block to get a color television. I didn't even know what color uniforms mm-hmm. they had for like the longest time, except that I started getting the posters and books and you know, then I knew, you know. But uh, as right. far as I know, it was just a whole gray army there. I didn't even know. But, um, yeah, no, but, and I didn't even know, they said that. Well, I had green skin, but you couldn't tell by me, you know. But uh, but the thing was, is it was just <laughs> eye popping, technicolor, you know. And um, of course, the red shirt guys were always in trouble, right? <laughs> they were always in trouble, right? Um, but it was just, yeah, from the beginning, um, yeah. So it was just, it was just in a, and it landed in the most interesting time because it was really, actually, kind of a grim time of our future. Even the science fiction right, I got into science fiction during that time. And the science fiction writers were writing of post-apocalyptic nightmares, and we had the Cold mm-hmm. War and the bomb, and there was a, a civil unrest. And I actually lived in the Bay Area, so in the Bay Area, the area of California. So there was a social unrest, and, and uh, people were, uh, you know, uh, up in arms about the Vietnam War, et cetera, et cetera, for this uh, future to arrive where we're all racially, we're all getting along. Um, we're exploring space together um, and w- having positive values uh, was remarkable when you're a kid and you really honestly don't know if you're even going to grow up. I mean, that's how seriously scary it was, mm-hmm. was, was I had my older teenage uh, uh, aunt tell me you probably won't, or her boyfriend anyway, said you probably won't even grow up, you know, because of just how scary the world was right then, you know, and especially right. when you were a kid. Because you didn't have any sense of the bigger picture of, you know, hope, you know. And I, I was a sort of a depressed little kid just because I was sort of overtly aware of that sort of thing. So for right. them to show that not only do we get over our problems on Earth, but we manage to build spaceships together and we go to space. And I, I just thought that was really helpful. And, boy, I just knew for sure, especially since the Apollo missions came along, I knew for sure that when I grew up, I was going to have a job in space. I, there's no doubt in my mind whatsoever that I was going to be working in space. So uh, it, it just had a huge impact on me that way. <clears throat> right. Well, uh, I was privy to part of the campaign that started the revival of Star Trek. In the, at the end of the first year, there was already talk that the numbers weren't there supporting it and that they were going to cancel it. So I talked to Sasha, my husband, Dr. Lesson, about this, and it's, I didn't realize until years later that there were many of us simultaneously reaching out in our schools and, uh, you know, friends and family and taking a little pen and paper and 
and signing these lists and mailing them into NBC, and we'd have all these signatures, <laughs> don't cancel our show. And I just did it every day. I got everybody in my school, um, and I sent them in. You know, they were in the, the lines of a yellow paper from, you know, well, I was 12, so what was I? I was in grade school still, right? And, and, but simultaneously, all over the world, people were mailing in these little uh, signature sheets with everybody signing. And uh, there was a woman named B. Jo Trimble or Trimble or something like that. It was almost like Tribble. And uh, she showed up at one of the early uh, conventions and she was explaining how, you know, she had led this whole movement. But it's like, no, you didn't lead this whole movement. I didn't even know you existed. I didn't know what was going on. I was. So it was like the, we were all tapping into this morphogenic field, and independently people were, were simultaneously getting it, like we can stop them taking this off. So we kept fighting them ongoing every time there was any rumor that they were going to take it off. But we, we just, um, you know, eventually we lost in 1969 yeah, was the last year it was on, the original series was on, and then we started going to the conferences. And I'm going to put this on our page. There was a wonderful video of uh, a conference in New York. I think it was 1973. We got organized and we went to New York. And I was there in, I think, the following two years, 74 and 75. I know I turned 21 in New York City at a Star Trek convention. And they were amazing because there were 20,000 people. Anyway, that's a little bit of the history from my awareness, but I'm sure there are a lot of people out there with functioning brain cells that have some awareness, too, of the, um, you know, the early episodes and the whole 50-year history. There are some people that that came in from number one that are still alive that have the whole thread, and it's just fascinating that it continues to this day. But what I want to shift to, and we'll have Brett come in, is what was the promise what, you know, when I was back in grade school, we were talking about the technology. It wasn't just the actors and all the, you know, shoot 'em up, bang, bang, and adventure. It was the hope for humanity and the future, the potential future. So it seems to me that I was on a different timeline, and somehow this timeline has been hijacked. And I want to say that the major hijacking of this timeline came with 911. It seemed like we were heading to a different future and we were getting to the Star Trekian utopian that we had been promised in the 60s. And all of a sudden, it was gone. <laughs> and we're into this paradigm, which is uh, pretty apocalyptic and no hope, no future for humanity. So let me pass the baton on to Brett to add his two cents and make a commentary on what I just said. Hello. Um, yes, I, I, I think um, it was, a, you know, during the time of the Cold War, and, uh, you know, there was a lot of unrest and, and all of that. And um, Star Trek, when it came on, you know, it, it, it showed the intention of the, the public and, and of the writers of the show and, and probably our governments, you know, that, that completely controlled the media. That they wanted people to know that, that that their intentions were very clear. That they wanted to go out into outer space and discover strange new worlds and all that, you know, just like the show suggests. Mm-hmm. And they they actually the the Apollo program was just kicking off around the time of the start of that show with um, Lunar Orbiter. <clears throat> so they had sent um, probes or robots out to take um, pictures of the moon and landing um, future landing sites for the Apollo missions. They had actually um, built um, 15 story um, rovers, you know, to, to, to traverse the moon's surface. They, they had actually built these like skyscraper sized, you know, vehicles to go around, um, you know, the surface of, of the, the planetoid that we call the moon. And they, they had also um, planned out, um, completely planned out um, all, all of the um, bases that they were going to put up on the moon and um, 
everything else. You know, they 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 were going to first send a man to the moon to discover what was there, and all that. And that completely halted when they found out what was actually on the moon. And um, I I don't know if it was a combination of they found out that the moon was hollow, that um, that of of course there were beings up on the moon already, you know, um, that, that were not you know wanting wanting us to to build a bunch of bases and all of these these cool things that they had planned out. But they had um, all the all the diagrams and um, artist um, representations of what they wanted to actually do up there. Uh, they they had um, they had bases. They had um, diagrams of uh, of space uh, mothership type um, things where for, where people could live on for a long time. Um, they had completely planned this. They they had executive meetings where they took um they, they showed these slides that was um the, the promise of the the future where they showed all of these these new ideas and these slides of, of what they planned on doing out in outer space when when they were kind of um selling all of this to the public because they wanted funding and all that. But it was more than just the funding thing. They really had the intention of going out into space and, and discovering all of these things. And when they actually did it, when they actually got there, um, for some reason, it completely halted. They went up to the moon five times, and then nothing. It completely ceased. You know, every all the projects were, were halted. Um, they, they actually threw everything away. Um, it was a big cover-up. So what you know, happened? They, it, what well, happened? they were they, they were home. told not to come back to the moon by beings that are already there. So who's there? Well, that's a good question. I don't know, but um, probably people that look like us, as well as mm-hmm. you know, grays or whatever is up there, reptoids. But so some uh, some much older race and technology is up on the moon. Mm-hmm. So that information hasn't been with, uh, snuck out to us by whistleblowers yet. Who is up there? And they're still yes, up there. Yes, they, they have not said who is there. Um, it it is probably an older uh, race, Earth race that was um, that that had much higher technology than we did. That actually had to to use the moon as an escape because we were. Apparently at war with them or something. Early on, um, so okay. you know when when the when the Anunnaki came here, um, they were already at war with the older Earth races, which were reptoids and whatnot. And they, they it it had been written about in in verbal history, you know, that was passed down. And someone finally mm-hmm. wrote it, um, the, the Terra Papers, uh, Robert Morning's guy, you know, wrote about this this fantastic thing, the, the Star Wars-like war that happened, you know, way back when in ancient times. And a, a lot of a lot of that carried over all the way into, into our time, you know. And I believe that our governments knew exactly what was on the moon. Mm-hmm. I believe that they had um, made some kind of treaties with with these reptoids or with these beings, um, these green men, because I believe that there's there's actually little green men, men on the moon, you know. Mhm. And they they had made a treaty treaty with these with these beings, you know, um, to to at least explore the moon a bit, you know. And I, and I believe that treaty ran out. You know, because of their arrogance, them coming up there and, and mm-hmm. posting flags, you know, and saying this is <laughs> this is property of the United States of America, you know. I, I yeah, believe it was our that. arrogance that that sent us on our way off the moon. Okay, so you know, so it's you just think how I feel about it. Arrogance, and they. To me, I'm I'm just looking at it, and I don't know much of anything, but. Um, 
<laughs> I think it's more like we're just not relevant. If they're already there, yes, established, you know, we're like like ants in their minds because they don't really hold us in that high of regard, the Anunnaki. So if it's the no. Anunnaki races, it's like, well, yeah, who, who do you think you are? You know, it's kind of like if, if somebody would come in and, and land in the United States and they say, okay, this is our territory, we'd go, well, who do you think you are? We've been here for 200 years, right? So they've been there for thousands and thousands of years, and it's like <laughs> you're coming to claim something, and we've been here, you know, for maybe millions of years, right? So I think that's a little bit of what's going on there. It's how can you put your flag here and say it's our yours when we have all these colonies here? So, and yeah, there, there's that like contingent, the and there was also the contingent that they had offered us peaceful ways of existing, <laughs> and our military and security denied that. Mm-hmm. You know, so there there was all of that going on too, um, and it, like I said before, it was that started around the Cold War, you know. And we carried on that another, superstition and insecurity question. for for years after that. But could they and right them? now we're we're at a time period where we're we're sort of learning by our mistakes of the past, you know. Mm-hmm. And and I believe that that we've got new um, affiliations with extraterrestrials as far as the moon goes. And I think Solar Warden is real. I think we are actually going out into space. Yeah, I think, you know, it's, I, I think it's, the uh, uh, there's, a, there's a public campaign, even the uh, the the, um, the whistleblower campaign. So you have the public campaign that they're telling people that you know we went when we went and and so then we're done going. Then you have the part. I think that a lot of the stuff they leak out, like oh we we went there and we were told not to come back, is part of the agenda as well. <laughs> So then we have that uh, reality. We're like, oh, we leaked and they had these advanced people saying, you know, get out of here and go back. And, you know, we have all these different stories that are out there. But what, you know, I look beneath and beyond all that, and I think what's really going on is that, you know, we have a, a, a joint effort out there. So <laughs> we have Americans and Russians and extraterrestrials, and there's a lot of activity going there. And, and that uh, there's two or three different cover front stories, you know, so they can appeal to those people that are like little investigators and whistleblowers and say, oh, I've got the real truth, but the real truth is there's all kinds of stuff going on there, and there are many facts. Yes, I agree. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm not so presumptuous, you know, as to say I know what's yeah. really going on, but that's what the evidence points to, exactly what mm-hmm. you just said. There's a bunch of different races and um People from Earth, um, the, as far as Earthlings go, Earthlings are Earthlings. I don't care if they're Russian or whoever, you know. They they mm-hmm. see them, they see us all as the same. You know, right. we came from Earth, okay. Um, that explains it, you know. <laughs> you know, that's our, <laughs> so we're, you know, we're but out in space. If you think of it, a, a thousand years from now, Earthlings <laughs> are going to look like many different extraterrestrials, and they're just going to... They'll go, what planet did you originate from? You know, just like now Americans right. are, you know, we look like anything. It used to be at one point we all looked kind of uh, like uh, yes, British right. and German and, and uh, you know, Irish people. But now we're, you know, look at the, the diversity of Americans. So imagine once we start mixing our DNA with <laughs> Well, we already did that uh, on, um, you know, on Earth. You know, we've we've got right. we've got Chinese people and black people and and um, the, the Irish people or whatever um, the mm-hmm. Pelagian you know empire and all that. We, we've got the um, Asian island people. You know, we, so we've got all of these mixtures of different DNA from space, and mm-hmm. we are from we, 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 it, you can see the you can see the genetics there. You know, it's it's plain to see. So right. we we've, yes. we have all of these different genomes coming from space, you know, and uh, we, we have I believe that we have successfully lived together. I really I do, even so, even I though there's wars of... and even though there's religious mm-hmm. issues and problems and and <laughs> politics and all of that. That's not really human. The politics and the religion and all of these things that cause wars and the poverty and everything else. That's not human. I believe humans actually successfully 
um, live together on Earth. You know. And we're, we are many different, um, I don't know what you would call them, species. I think part of the problem is, you know, the program we were getting is to try to have everybody look like models on a, on a cover. And then you get criticized when, you know, your breasts are a different size or your hips are a different size or you're tall or you're short or you're thin or you're fat. When these species that are very diverse that are mixed with extraterrestrial and humans and there are different types and that we need to stop shaming people because they don't fit a certain body image because that's, you know, not what's going on. It's like trying to make all cats uh, Persians and all dogs German Shepherds. There are a variety of different species, and that's natural, but human tends to say, okay, here's what a human's supposed to look like, and they're on the cover of magazines. <laughs> um, so that's part of the problem. This, this right, that, that's exactly us. it, yeah. Yeah. We're, yeah, we're we're you know we're we're human, and um, to to express the diversity of human beings on Earth, you know, it, it's uh, it's quite a colorful picture, you know, and mm-hmm. the, the 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 there's there's a difference between the the external how we look and and what our genetic makeup is and all of that, than our spirit. Our spirit mm-hmm. is also that's extraterrestrial. Nice yeah, and it, and there there's a lot of different types of spirits out there. The ones that are running everything right now, probably not real good spirits. You know, they're kind of insecure. You know, um, they're when it comes down to it, they're very insecure. Um, they they don't want peace for for everybody because that means that they won't be the captains of the ship and the and the rich people or whatever. You know. So Mm -hmm. there's that type of insecurity, and and they are willing to build an army to protect that. You know, so there's there's that contingent going on. And and Star Trek said the opposite of all that. They said we can all get along and there's no need for war, and they actually went out into space and stopped um, extraterrestrials from fighting each other and everything. You know, so everything was completely the opposite of what, human beings or or these these bad spirits actually did when they started running everything you know so the, yeah, we that, had the we had the Vulcan idic infinite oh, yeah. diversity and infinite combinations and that was our model of you know respecting consciousness and all life so we're dealing with this current paradigm and it's now being overlaid with Star Trek and I want to give Karen, a chance to speak her mind here. So let's pass the time to Karen. Yeah, well, this is an interesting conversation because we have this this huge franchise with uh, uh, so many different stories and sub-stories. And and one of my good Star Trek friends had a total meltdown when they started the new Star Trek iteration because it changed the timeline. And he was very upset by that. He says, they can do anything they want now, and these old stories don't even matter anymore. And He didn't even speak to me after that. When I said, well, that just makes it interesting, and he's like, he didn't speak to me after that. But, you know, we have diehard Trek fans, you know, that, that, that want things a certain way, or remember the, they're very fond of how the whole thing played out. But, but you know, this it's an interesting thing where you have these people who are pre- predicated to, and exposed to the idea of extraterrestrials, and this has happened to me a number of times. I, as an experiencer and a contactee, where somewhere along the line I made a shift from just aren't these stories really cool and identify with them to suddenly realizing I was actually in contact with other beings. Um, you know, it, it's like a bridge too far for a lot of fans it's because they they want the par- they want the fictional paradigm. They're not prepared for whatever reason for the reality of the fact, the actual reality of it, uh, being a, a crowded universe out there if it doesn't look like the Star Trek that they know and love. And uh, you can literally say to them, it's all true. It's true. It's really true. There really is a confederation or federation or whatever you want to call it, planets. There's really 
spaceships, there's motherships, there's other beings, and they're trying to contact us. And oh, there's these, these cadre of people who, for whatever reason, were open, and maybe even they didn't think they were open, to being contacted and becoming contactees. There's people who've been abducted. There's people who uh, know they are from these races, um, you know, different ones who know that they were seated here, you know, that they actually look human, that they're not human, and somehow they're adopted, and they don't know their adopted parents because they were seated here. Um, there's people who have families that they know have an alien um, DNA component. So we literally have aliens if you will, walking among us, um, talking to us, interacting with us, abducting us. This is a, a crowded universe, and it's making itself known, at least uh, what I call on the experiencer path, okay? And you you can tell them it's all true, and they can't accept it. It's like their minds cannot, they can accept every nuance of the fun story of the, that paradigm of fiction, but the reality of it, reality of it they literally can turn around and, and Mock and ridicule, uh, but heaven help you if you mock and ridicule their their story paradigm. But I think that's interesting. Where it's sort of a picture of where humans are at. We're somewhat conflicted about the the idea of a Star Trek paradigm and the re- potential reality of a Star Trek paradigm. But I do believe that all of these, and as I've uh, put on the goggles of looking at uh, story franchises, different franchises, Star Wars, Star Trek, uh, Dune, those are the three I think I paid the most attention to, and finding out how many um, aspects of, you know, the paradigm galactic that's out there we're looking at, Um, just just different types of aliens, different types of existences. Um, I've been... Uh, indicated to me by insider with the blower type people that uh, all of those paradigms play in, including the Dune paradigm being that the most dominant story in the Dune paradigm is um, the spice, and that might be monatomic gold, the his, hidden history of monatomic gold that relates to the Anunnaki, mm-hmm. the Star Wars paradigm being primarily about the Orion Wars, and a lot of what happens on Earth is because we're where uh, iteration from a time of war, which is talked about in contact the information like the um, the raw material and whatnot, and that we there was a, a that some of the Orion Confederation were stayed uh, kind of hierarchical and evil, and that's a, afflicted us in the area of religion, politics, and control control of humanity, and other parts of the Orion you know broke free and are trying to help. Uh, other races, including the human race on planet Earth, to, you know, get out of the thought form prison. Because, you know, if if you have something where you can have people under the thumb, under the thumb in an entire empire like it says in Star Wars, then you've got a powerful mindset that's being projected on people that they would continue to be a part of that empire or whatever. And in Star Trek, um, the, the early Star Trek, the conflicts were, the big conflicts were like, the humans and the, let's say, the Klingons, and then with their allies being the, the Vulcans. So we, we got to know those races the most. And interestingly enough, the, the Klingon human war was trying to become an actual shooting war, and there was a group of light beings called the Organians, and they made a peace treaty that said, okay, you can't fight each other, that you're, you're going to have to go and uh, uh, you know, compete on how to make the universe a better place or the galaxy a better place and help uh, other planets that are struggling. So that was an interesting turn of events within that first iteration of the show. And then subsequently, though, uh, in later iterations, and in, in I don't want to do too much spoiler of the movie. Brett and I watch, went and watched the Star Trek <laughs> Beyond movie. And, and you this prompted us having this uh, program because you watched it too and just to spoil right. it a little bit. Yeah, they had this uh, this uh, um, space station. Uh, was very, very, very large, uh, almost like a it's a world into itself, and uh, it, it was very peaceful, beautiful, well organized, well mannered, high standard of living for everybody place, and it of course was threatened. And the the fact that um, you know the war, I suppose, would be in defense of places like this to protect it. So they have tried to have that, but there's almost a continual, you know, warlike theme in, in all of the things. And I, I get tired, man. It's like if I'm watching any movie 
and there's a battle, I'm, and, and I'm watching it, and I can fast forward, you know. <laughs> I'm going to fast forward and just find out who won and what happened. You know, I don't really want to well, see the, the gore and the shooting and stuff. I mean, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to comment on that because it's why I don't want to get too far down the line here because this is very important. <clears throat> so here we have a utopian reality where now all these races and species and people are – living together in a huge planet-sized globe um, and with high technology, teleportation, probably, you know, longevity and cures for all diseases and elimination of much of the common day pain and suffering that we endure. And yet there always seems to be in the need of these modern-day 21st century Bang, bang, shooting them up, westerns in the sky, you know, wagon train to the stars, to have the protagonist, the evil person or being or entity that comes in and wants to destroy it all. In fact, the, the, um, the evil being in, in this uh, species, this, I mean, the series, this episode of the ongoing series, Star Trek, called everybody that was living in peace the hand holders. <laughs> and he was a fight. So that, I wanted to take that whole concept, which was in a movie, the universe, and the necessity of existence to have the polarity, light and dark, upon which we have creation and creativity. And are we ever going to get to an existence, be it Star Trek or, or you know, if we can project ourselves into a million years in the future, where the where there will be a, a time where we no longer need the the um, protagonist, the enemy, the the Satan, the devil, the the you know the opposite of goodness, love, and light. And I think, um, well, I'll just throw that out on the table. Both of you can choose to respond to that. That might be the nice uh, the next section here. What we will talk about because that frustrates me, just like you, Karen. Can we get? We see the one that's oh, now, yeah. where is the real meat of the story? And yeah. then I keep going to Sasha, who says, I hate violence, I don't want to watch it. And he, he, he cuts out every movie that has yeah. violence. So I go, well, how do we move they, past that? Yeah. Go ahead, back to you, Karen. Because, yeah, because a lot of people, if violence is their entertainment, I mean, watching this thing, <clears> I could say, oh, okay, here's where the game's going to happen. You know, they just shoot them up, banging up game, because that's the other that's another genre that I know a lot of people enjoy. Uh, I don't personally enjoy it. It, it, it seems very dominating, uh, what they call first-person shooter, where you're in a space pod and you've got weapons and you're going to kill the enemy. I mean, it seems like we have a tremendous amount of our entertainment invested in this sort of thing, which I think sort of has to do with uh, the – level we are of the actual technology of our entertainment. That's the easiest sort of storyline that, that you can have, whereas I think down the road, so I was with a group that was talking about Pokemon Go, which is that augmented reality thing. Um, one augmented reality group is actually making it possible for you to wear these glasses and you could literally make a sculpture uh, in your living room, but it would be virtual reality oriented. And so now you you can spend lots of your time not doing a shoot 'em up game, but using the technology to do something creative. So one of the things I could see our our actual entertainment stuff is moving. It, it could it could make the choice as our technology grows to make something uh, that where you build something or you learn something instead of you have to kill something and get imaginary points or whatever. So I don't I don't know the answer to that one. Um, I just know that it, you know it's given a chance to. Well, I mean for me, okay, um, I did make an actual choice a while back that it, it, that instead of being a science fiction fan all the time and into it all the time, I got kind of bored with it because that's kind of what it always was about. Was uh, everything was decided by some form of combat, and I got more into okay, is there a reality to this? And of course that became opened a wide door of, oh my gosh, I, I've learned about this um, whistleblower talking about, let's say uh, Alex Collier talking about the founder race, and then all of a sudden they talk about it in Star Trek, this founder race. So it's Ooh, like, whoa, you right. know, 
there's a they're feeding information from whistleblowers um, into this genre. Now that to me is interesting. So then you find out, like right off the bat, you find out a lot of people don't know this. Gene Roddenberry was part of a, a, a group where there was people doing channeling of a entity consciousness called the Nine. And um, and he was going to these meetings on a regular basis. And some of the other people that were at these meetings were insiders, psychics, contactees, experiencers. So, you know, he was kind of plugged into a very um, uh, interesting subgenre of just his own interest, you know, that that prompted him to want to do the show and prompted to want to, to weave into the shoot him up storyline. I mean, how many times did Kirk have a, you know, fist fight in these things? It was like a little mm-hmm. bit over the top. But he always had to have a fist fight. He always had to get his shirt torn, you know. I was like part of it. was like in the script, you know, contract. I've had my shirt torn at least, you know, once every other episode. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, but, I mean, as a result, though, um, it was it was ostensibly to resolve something a little bit more highbrow, you know, in the mm-hmm. story, it was to save a planet or or stop a, a mindless robot from taking over sentient beings, that sort of thing. I mean, his purpose was a higher purpose, and so he was trying. He was really trying, given this limited genre, to raise the consciousness and raise the ideals. And that that's the difference between a Trekkie and a Trekker, I think. And that's a big debate. But early on, people who consider the, themselves trekkers found themselves drawn, drawn to the higher ideals of science and what we could do with technology and how it could serve a peaceful end. And, um, you know, science fiction has always been a great place to talk about very um, esoteric and high ideals that typically don't play out in our current Earth experience, you know, everyday life. So mm-hmm. it's an either-or thing, but it's, it's, if, I, if the one takeaway I'd want anyone to come from what our discussion is that that, that is that all these shows, the Star Wars, Star Trek, all of them, all this fiction is being used for soft disclosure, is being used to educate uh, the Earth people that what is not just that there's something going on in space, but what is going on out there. Okay, not that the truth mm-hmm. is out there, but here's what's actually happening, but they're doing it through this, uh, these limited genres that humans have. So, you know, by the, down the road, when they, when they first started trying to tell us, we flipped out like a War of the Worlds and people were jumping out of the, you know, building, jumping off buildings and shooting themselves and going crazy. Um, they didn't, they, they wanted to know, they wanted us to let us know a little bit, bit, more, bit by bit, you know, what the story w- it was. So it is not the generation then, maybe our generation or beyond, would be ready to be curious and excited and not afraid. And I don't know if the shoot 'em up part really helps that, but it's like we got a basic xenophobia so entrenched that you literally can't tell somebody who's even a fan of the fiction that it is a reality. Uh, there's a level of this mockery thing that goes on. So... We're we're in a very interesting time with this material because it's kind of a manual for what's really going on, and I'll pass it to Tom. Mm-hmm. Okay, <clears throat> Brett. <clears throat> um, my goodness, <laughs> you guys have said a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we're talkers. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, my gosh. Um. The, you know the 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 thoughts that I have as as far as like um, um, what we 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 could do if we wanted to as a as a human race you know um, on Earth or whatever um, we know this these things because we you know we put it out in our art we we put it out in the ideals of our governments. So we we know what to do. So it, you 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 basically um, when you look at what they are doing as opposed to what they know is right, um, you you really wonder is there some kind of um, are there some beings out there that are controlling us somehow, or or are controlling our governments because we know better. 
we put it, we, we we express that deeply in our art and whatnot. So, mm-hmm. you know, uh, do do we we obviously know better, you know. So uh, there's there's this insecurity and this this thing coming from somewhere else, and it's not coming from humans. There's no way it could be. So the, whatever is going on. Um, seems to me to be something that is learned from a negative force out there. So it, it, mm-hmm. it's it, it's something <clears throat> it, it's something that that there's. I mean, we're not adri- we're not that addicted to the the drama of watching the the trapeze artist fall. You know, we're mm-hmm. we're not that addicted to something like that. We don't really. Act, yeah, I've never known actual human beings that enjoy watching someone get a heart attack or watching someone get into a car crash, you know, and and sure they they look, but I think it's more out of concern, you know. Um Great. Yeah, so so the the basically our civilization is the car crash that that these other extraterrestrial races are looking at out of concern. You know, we're we're crashing. Mm-hmm. We've crashed. We're all hanging out of trees, you know. Mhm. And uh, basically, you know, they're they're basically stopping for con- um, out of concern. You know, what 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 are they doing? You know, right. So, so there's got to be some kind of negative force that that's making these these leaders of of our world do these things because it is their fault, a hundred percent. It is their fault because but no. What do you think the, it is? Oh gosh! Kind of I, I, force. Is it the uh, reptilians? Is it the archons? Is it... Right. They they could be any of those things, but that's how I that's how I'm saying it is some kind of negative force. But it, it um they worship these these leaders. They actually worship these archons and these the, the they invoke these negative entities all the time. They, it's their religion. It's their actual religion, mm-hmm. you know. So, so it, these so people are different. From, what do they get from worshiping or being in service to or being? Uh, well, they get power. Their, it, their consciousness. So they get power. Yes, they they get okay. power. They they put out they they put out the money as a spell, you know. Okay, you people, th- this is um, this is your god now, you know. So they put money out as a spell. That they don't even use. These people don't use these things. They're talisman to these people, you know. So they they distribute them or whatever, and they um, they they do very dark magic over them. Even the artwork itself is dark. It's old and dark. Mhm. The you know none none of this stuff you know um, should be this way, and and they, they they're using all of these things against us. You know, to keep us enslaved and everything else because they get a great deal of power from it. Um, they get to keep what they have. You know, a lot of them are well, uh, a lot of them are just that. greedy people, you know. Then they get don't to keep what they have. Starting to wrap up, you know, like come to an end. It, sure. it seems that in the circles I travel at least that people are becoming awake. I interviewed somebody oh, yeah. the other day, and she says, "I'm awake now. What do I do? I'm out of the box. I'm awake. I'm, you know, I took the, I forget which one, the red pill, the blue pill. <laughs> you know, I'm no longer in that. So, what can I do about that? And uh, so people are starting to operate from I'm awake, and uh, I'm I'm operating from I'm awake. I mean, I don't know it all, but I'm certainly a lot more conscious than a lot of people, and. And I'm more in the observer mode of this stuff going on. It doesn't. I'm not engaged in it. I'm outside going, what is going on? But I'm not. There's some people that are so engaged in it, they're acting it out, and they're emotionally involved in this uh, negative paradigm of control manipulation. And I'm, I'm sitting here going, well, I'm over that. I mean, I never really was in it, but definitely any kind of attachment or investment in that whatsoever is, Totally gone from my understanding and my being. So, what's going on with the rest of the world? And I think a lot of the rest of the world is saying, 
okay, you know, how many ways can we kill each other? How many ways can we die? We end up on the other side of the veil and in between lives. And we're going, well, that was interesting. I just died, you know, falling off the Twin Towers or something. You know, it's something bigger and more extreme and more, it's almost like Hollywood and, and lights, camera, actions, and it's, it's your life. It's not just a, uh, a movie. It's your life, and then you're, you're dead, and you're on the other side. go, wow, what a wild ride. You know, how can I top that next life? Well, you don't need to. Now it's time to have a peaceful existence and coexist, much like Star Trek started 50 years ago this year, yet another month in, a, in four days. Yeah, September 8th. Very important day. I think we need to do something on that day. September 8th of 2016, 50 years that we started this new paradigm. So I'd like to invite the three of us to go into this potential, Mm -hmm. this universe, this future, the positive outcome, free of the demons and the whoever they are that are trying to control, manipulate us, we're awake now. Now, what can we do with this? Karen. Take Love it. it. I'm glad we're having this very intellectual discussion because I think Star Trek prompted that kind of thinking. Um, <clears throat> well, I'll start with an idea I've had because uh, Brett and I have been working with uh, Dr. Ken Johnston, who worked with NASA um, in the early years. He had four positions in various contracts with NASA at different times. And so, you know, we were just little kids at the time, so this is our education for us to find out what the whole NASA creature was trying to do, you know, as an entity itself. And and it's interesting because um, NASA was ostensibly a peaceful idea to explore space. I've talked to one NASA insider who said it was not the intention of a there to be actually a space race. The intention was to uh, actually join with the Russians in the effort. However, that was kiboshed by military advisors. They didn't want to do that, so they turned it into a space race. Of course, later, not too much later after that, we had the Apollo-Soyuz mission, which was uh, basically a joint missions, and from then on we've had them with the International Space Station. So, um <clears throat> Yeah, this was a situation where um, the high levels were always, uh, you know, keeping us feeling insecure so that we would have these identities, America, Russia. We were way more rivalrous, or everyone was aware of the rivalry at the time. Um, They even poked fun at that with the Chekhov character, excuse me, in Star Trek always saying that the Russians, you know, invented just about everything and had some fun with it, and I think that was healthy one of the healthiest things you could mm-hmm. have at that right. particular time, I thought. But um, I got caught up in studying this this idea called the ticket to space, okay? So I'm going, you know, at least on the public face of it, nobody, not the Russians nor ourselves nor the Chinese nor anybody on the face of it, okay, not counting the secret space program because I know people listening know that there is a secret space program, and I do believe in it as well. But just on the face of it, um, we're saying, okay, what is it going to take for us to go to space? And, and one of the things they figured out right away is that we need to do it together. It's not going to be something one country is going to be able to do. So hence uh, we've had the International Space uh, uh, Station and uh, that you know, idea that we're going to do explore space together. Kennedy even had it in his mind that the uh, there might be a separate space mission, a, a Soyuz or some sort of mission, and a, and a NASA mission, and they would meet on the moon and shake hands. And the idea was to unite the world in peaceful exploration in space rather than going to war over, you know, territory, oil, resources, everything. That did not, that was not what happened. Of course, Kennedy was assassinated. The people who benefit by war mongering um, continued on, and we've had you know wars ever since. So that idea got, got kiboshed, so to speak. And it's funny because it's even some of the same companies that continued out 
permanent war economy that Alfred Weber said before has been, um, mm-hmm. you know, the same ones that actually did the space program. This ticket to space idea came to me because uh, I would live in New Mexico here. New Mexico has a spaceport. Hello, we have a spaceport on planet Earth. It's in New Mexico, wow. and it was uh, put together under the auspices of the idea that Sir uh, Richard Branson, the very wealthy person from England, was going to build a space station. It's going to do the space some form of a space shuttle, and he was going to take very wealthy people because the tickets were something like a million dollars a piece or something like that. So a billionaire was going to take millionaires to space and have them experience uh, weightlessness, as well as what Dr. Edgar Mitchell often said was that Samadhi experience or realizing that we're just on this one mothership, planet Earth, and that hopefully it would change their mindset. So... But that has not happened. They've had um, technical difficulties and crashes and issues. And I thought, well, okay, so now we're down the road in a global economic turndown where um, the the 99%, all of us, you know, economically are going further down in our financial capacity. And the 1% is taken off just like a rocket in their financial capacity to the point where we have roughly 60 people who own half the world's wealth. Um, so the ticket to space, in my mind, would it was if there was being saying we're not ready, like it was said on the air on Apollo 17, don't, don't come back, you're not ready to get, is because we simply have not acknowledged that a mature or maturing uh, race would take care of every person in its society adequately to have people be billionaires and millionaires. And one a very wealthy man said, get ready, there's going to be some trillionaires pretty soon. And then have other people who are dying of starvation in refugee camps, uh, children especially suffering, which are, you know, the, our, that's our future, uh, is, is the sign of a very sick, a profoundly ill, profoundly immature society. And the people who are wealthy have very immature, you know, um, values of just almost adolescent values of you know of just party time. We see them on TV having parties all the time, and the rest of us are watching them party. I mean, it's disgusting. So it's kind of like the ticket to, to space in my mind. Uh, what will be allowed? What will, what will be uh, welcomed? Is that we rise up and grow up, provide for everybody adequately, um, you know, and and share the resources. And then as a result, I think one other thing is that we won't, you know, we cannot take our scarcity mindedness with us to space. People have to learn to survive in a sustainable way in space. Right now, we don't know how to survive sustainably. For instance, our fuel modalities require fuel that has to be burned, and you have to get some more. I mean, that's really stupid. If you were in a spaceship, you need to have your own well, of course, they had dilithium warp drives, right? In, in, in a star, they were always running out of dilithium, right? <laughs> they were in Star Trek. But, I mean, the, the <laughs> yeah, idea was... Like, dilithium crystals, yes. Yes, they had to play a lot of gold press latinum to get the dilithium. But, yeah, they, they were still running on fuel, which is really silly. Even Nikola Tesla would be going, what? You know? Um, no, they would obviously have to find some sustainable power source uh, that wasn't a fuel base. And so, uh, the, and then that's where the fun begins, once you've got your um, ship uh, sustainable and it's uh, got its own little biosphere going and everyone's healthy and happy, then you can take off and explore those strange new worlds and not steal, you know, resources from the planets that you visit, you know, like some races in Star Trek were shown to be doing. So, yeah, the thing to space uh, is that we have a planet, a really united planet, but just wise, just provide, just, you know, war is stupid. So don't stop being stupid and, you know, make the competition. How well can we improve things? How well can we take the smart people and compete for how well can we make the future better? And this is our choice. Our basis, baseline choice is are we going to fight each other for the last scrap of a drop of oil or water or whatever, or are we going to work together to learn how to re- have renewable resources? And we're still in that discussion to this present day, but the future that is Star Trek type future, positive future, we're going to have resolved that, or we're not going to be having a lot of fun. So I'll pass the stick. Okay, Brett. Um, wow, that's interesting. 
Um, well, guys, this, this should be our final round. You know, let's, we can make this our final round. We don't have to keep going back and forth. Um, what I yeah, the, what I thought the, we could touch upon before we end is, you know, like uh, what kind of social system will we have? I know Karen and I like to talk about basic minimum needs economy, and I'd like to wrap our heads around, you know, this future, the Star Trek future, which could be our now and how we would move past all of this into a situation where people have their needs met and more, and they have the ability to go up and join, you know, the Federation. Well, and yeah, I mean, the, 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 the Star Trek economy is a barter system. It is a, a complete trade. Mm-hmm. You know, they went out in space, you know, even the Ferengi, they're very greedy little monkeys or whatever out in space and have really bad teeth and and they <laughs> they 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 trade, you know. They they right. trade, they um, trade whatever they whatever they have, um dilithium crystals or whatever, you know. <laughs> but mm-hmm. so they 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 trade and that's what we should do is trade our resources and um we can't really trade our resources now because they've hoarded them. Because that's what money really right. is. That's what it really means, you know. Um, we used to trade obsidian, you know, as a mineral, a, a dragon glass, you know. They they used to call it all kinds of things, uh, druid something or another. Mm-hmm. But it has this black glass-like lava stuff, you know. And they used to trade that for money. They used to trade um, um, the, these little clay things for money, you know. But it was uh, mm-hmm. it was ba- literally a uh, resource, you know, that they used to trade gold, silver, this so sort of thing. So do you think we'll still have money? Um, Sasha talked to me about a concept that, you know, no, basically we won't. Uh, each hour, uh, every hour of labor is equal to just one, and everybody's hour of labor is of labor is equal to every other hour of labor. So. Right. So wrap your head around this. That if you want to be a doctor, a lawyer, or Indian chief, you don't. You're not that because you make more money. You're that because that's what you love to do. <laughs> yes, that's and exactly that right. Reward, that's what our resources will be. You know. Yeah. You're um, what we're really you truly to do good what at. You love. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, what you're good at. And you're contributing. Like if you're a great artist or a great singer or a great dancer or a great healer or a great whatever, that's your contribution. That's your reward is that you feel good about yourself and your life and what you're giving to your fellow beings. Yeah, ma- many times be. that, that is, that's exactly what we're trading even in, within our monetary system. Uh, you know, we're, uh, oh, you're really good at that healing stuff? Please do this for me, and I'll and and you know, I'll get you guys some something nice later or whatever. So you know, the, even within our monetary system, we're still trading our um, our talents or whatever we're good at, you know, uh, because people the see the sense that, in it, even though, even if it, it's something that we don't get paid for normally, you know. Well, the problem with that is when you don't get your needs left, you don't have. Uh, dispensary, what do you call that? You, you, you don't have money, you can just kind of go beyond your needs. So then you're just right. down, down meeting your needs. And so that's why, well, I'm over here in the kind of the new age healing world, right? But right, yeah. that doesn't happen very much anymore now because they've got to go buy their food or their gas to get around. So Yeah, we're, we're still we're working, working within that system. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. We still and have to work within that system. It's um, what they, then, they they've got the thumb on us, you know. Right, and they hijack all the healing work to the 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 system, which is those people that are cleared by the American Medical Association, and and they have you know money that way through um, insurance. Right, yeah, they have all of these systems going on, and and it's all the more reason why they need us, you know. They they need healers, they need. They need people, when the system has failed, you know, they can't find the cure for fibromyalgia or something. Well, they, then they go to alternative sources. Even the rich people do that. 
they mm-hmm. they go to alternative healing, you know. In fact, most of them just go to the alternative healing first because they know that that our um, American Medical Association is completely corrupt, you know, and right. and all of these healthcare systems are corrupt. So they just go straight to the um, homeopathic stuff first <clears throat> as a as a first re- resort, you know, not a last one. Um, the the last one is going in, you know, uh, to some hospital or whatever. Um, they're they're still needed for surgery. They're still needed for something major. But as far as like um, any anything that that anyone would need drugs for, there is a homeopathic um, alternative for that. Almost always. Mm-hmm. And some some of course are not legal at the moment. You know, not everywhere. But um, as far as, like, pain management and that, you know, um, the pot works for that or whatever, you know. Uh, so there, there's there's all kinds of different alternatives. Uh, there's um, there, there's homeopathic plants that our drug and, uh, um, administration has, has completely um, banned, you know. They've they've banned vitamins. They've, they've banned all of these things. Um because they work, you know, mm-hmm, yeah. and yeah, yeah, so that, so that they can make more money with sick people having to come in to a hospital or something, and they don't know what's wrong with them, you know. And most of that stuff could yeah. have been prevented. So yeah, it's right. it's kind of like that. It's a very greedy system that it's completely corrupt, and people have to sort of see through it. In order to get on with their lives and and um, to outgrow the system, and once we outgrow the system, it has to change because they'll, they'll no longer make money; they'll go into attrition. So they do have to change their ways on that. And I think um, on the bright side, uh, a lot of traditional doctors, especially PAs, are going to alternative medicine. And they're mm-hmm. they're they're telling people about certain things that could work, you know, um, that they should try first before they try this or whatever. So uh, a lot of good things are happening within the medical field now, because they know more and they know people are aware of it. Well, that's good news. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah, there is a Star Trek future. It is the only future, <laughs> you know. The, that is the only way right. to go. Um, otherwise, we're we're just gonna kind of crash and burn, and and um, the ETs are are gonna drive by in concern, you know, kind of, you know, stop up traffic or whatever, you know, out of concern for us. <laughs> Do you think there? You think there's any interventions, you know, because it's kind of like we didn't get a fair start to begin with. Our we're not getting all the information. Somebody yes, came they, here they, and took our reality and, you know. There actually is intervention. We're doing it right now. We are ETs. We are we are helping right now. Mhm. And um, you know, yeah. it, we're we you know, we come into these bodies as a spirit or whatever. We're extraterrestrials, you know. And and right now we are intervening because we we are in the muck of it. We're we're down in it, you know, and so we, mm-hmm. we so we can see it. We can see exactly what's going on, and what the problem really actually is. And you know, who knows? Maybe we're um, maybe we're, we're recording all of these things or whatever um, for some horrible force out there. Who knows? But right now, the way I see it is we're we're down here and we're trying to help by visualizing and living the experience um uh, of the of the problems that exist so that we can fix those and come mm-hmm. up with a reasonable way to fix those you know um that that would make even even the um people that are con- trying to control everything happy because without without us they have nothing to control they have nothing they will go into attrition if if all they have left is their resources So if they don't distrib- redistribute the resources, we can't make more resources. We can't help, you know. 
Um, for instance, um, if they don't let us grow crops or whatever because they've taken taken up all the land and subsidized everything, we can't grow food. They're doing it on purpose. Mm-hmm. You know, so so these these things they have to let let loose the restraints of the resources so that we can make more resources, and everybody's happy. And they they see it as you know, of course, um, uh, kind of starving everybody out or whatever to make their thing more valuable. And that's mm. that's not going to work. It's not going to make it more valuable because people will come to the understanding that they can't attain that. They can't have that. So there why there's no use, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's actually worth less if, if they don't distribute the resource. I and, agree. Right, yeah, absolutely. And right now, um, uh, it would satisfy everybody if they went to an actual capitalistic system, you know, the kind where, where it's actually supply and demand, like trade used to be. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, right like now, it's not supply and demand. Control. Beans are still $3 a pound or whatever, you know. Mm-hmm. So, And it's staying that price, even though people aren't buying them. You mm-hmm. see what I mean? Right, right. I know it's artificially influenced. Oh, absolutely. It happens for many, many, many years, right? Because yeah. So that would be one because. of the things that would solve the immediate problem is to actually go back to a an actual capitalistic system and with with um, limits and guidelines. You know. Mhm. So that, that's one way to do it. Um, until we can grow up and not need that until we can t- be a resource-based society. You know, like Karen talks about all the time, I, I love that idea, you know. Right. Um, but, but, yes, there there is a, there's a way to get to that because these people are stubborn and they're insecure. So there's, a, there's definitely a way to get to that level. I agree. Yeah, because we, we don't want to kill millions of people to get to that level, you know. Yeah, we don't need to. That would be a way. real shocker, yeah. So I don't know. That, that's kind of how I feel about stuff like that. And, yes, there's a Star Trek future because that, that, that would be the only way to go, you know, mm-hmm. a resource-based society. Can't wait. <laughs> yeah, so space, yeah. the final frontier is the space right in front of us, right in front of us. Mm-hmm. That that is that that is the exploration that we need to do right now. Is fix our own space, you know, before going right. out there and infecting and infecting them with false capitalism and false flags and everything else. You know, <laughs> we we well, don't I, need to go up I there with that attitude. All, I think the extraterrestrial presence, the awareness of other systems and how they do their economies and. And their societies and how they distribute everything, so everybody gets to meet that. We'll just take down this whole current paradigm, which is it's really yeah. uh, torturous to most people to, to be in a constant state of fear and worry about how they're going to, you know, get their needs their needs met and you know pay the bills and keep the lights on and yada yada. And it's a, it's a very abusive it allows the abuse and you know greed and. And lack and competition to the point where it's just uh, you know it's hideous. It's actually hideous. And so I think we're at the final throes of that, and people realizing that that's not the way to be treated or to treat people. And we're starting to let go. It's childhood end, and this this greed paradigm is fading away. And I'm you know encouraging people every day to yeah. I mean, you might not be able to do it from the global level, but like you said, just start with your own lives and your own self and your own mission, which is the people that are in your lives and the animals, and just, and just start being nice, you know, just stop the cruelty and just lay down, unilaterally lay down your weapons that you have, you know, your your sharp tongue and your criticism, and just, uh, you know, start being nice to everybody in your lives and make the Star Trek reality in your lives personally and then it will just extend naturally to a global and then international, I mean, then a universal level, which I 
it is happening. It is happening because these things that we talk about, these things that are in our culture, like Star Trek, uh, they affect everybody. Whether you go to the movies or not, they affect everybody into the grid. This information goes in the grid. This awareness that there are intelligent species that live in harmony, that love each other, that care about each other, that respect each other. That is a concept that is penetrating down from this uh, awareness that it just exists and, and it's becoming a reality. And the operating system for this. Okay, our final route, Karen, what would you like to say? What would you like to add? Oh, yeah, you know, um, what was what's interesting and part of the reason why the overt uh, society consensus reality just puts the kibosh on us knowing about other races. So somehow it's okay. They'll have the same people go, they'll go see this movie or they'll watch sci-fi or whatever. But the minute you say, oh, I, I'm a contactee or I've been abducted, then then there's ridicule factor. I mean, this is an active, ongoing societal choice. You know, this is uh, our media, our secret government and stuff, because they really, really don't want us to engage with other beings. And many, I'm a contactee primarily, and the thing that I, I've gotten from that experience is it becomes comparative, uh, you know, anthropology. So, for instance, one um, group of beings, they're observing humanity, and they're really, really confused by the fact that um, that children are trafficked, are starved, are um, abused, um, that, that, that that's allowed on the planet, it's quite right, widespread. And um, I honestly can't answer that. I'm actually quite embarrassed to, to say that, that, yeah, that is true. We do have that here. And that's appalling to them because um, that is the, they're the opposite. Their whole society is bent around, you know, children are the future. They really believe that, and they have a very high value on, on children. They're young and, you know, train them and feed them. There's no way, not one single, I'm talking about no child left behind, not one of those beings is really left behind. And so that comparative, you know, with, with many, many thousands and thousands. I mean, this is the, the experiencer phenomenon. The contactee phenomenon is not a small thing. There are hundreds, thousands, perhaps even millions of people having ongoing contact, and, and some of it's negative, but not all, is the fact that we start to really find out about other civilizations, and maybe some of them are not pleasant or just, just they have a different value system than us. But generally speaking, we kind of often come up off being looking primitive and, um, you know, what's wrong with us? And they, they're curious. They don't understand. Like, like I like Brett's drive-by uh, an, an analogy, like, what's going on? Mm-hmm. And so they're curious. It's like, how can that be like that? You know, on the other hand, we have some things about us that are kind of appealing and interesting. But that one, you know, factor is the powers that be, so to speak, don't want that comparative anthropology where we literally – compare the apples and the oranges and whatever, and we see, oh, you know, we've, we've got a problem here. As compared to other races out there, we are uh, very cold towards the earth children, you know. And then that's going to cause a response, you know. It, you know, for myself, you know, I I uh, raised my children. I homeschooled them as long as I could. We're concerned about the education system. I've done advocacy for different things in the community. I mean, on this particular topic, might not be the one I do the most with, but it's it's realizing that, you know, inside of me, I can feel a sense of there's something not quite right about society. I, I have a comparison. I have an inner comparison that, I'm from somewhere where this looks wrong to me, this, these different problems that we have, okay? How do, if I was raised here and this is my only reality, how on earth would I have a sense of there's really something wrong with our, our, the environment being treated this way or, or humans' being, rights being violated? It's because somewhere I do have that ET communication or even a spirit from another place. So I look around and, and I kind of see what some of the problem areas are. 
And, you know, in my own way, I could talk about them and, and maybe act directly in some situations, um, you know, with that inner knowing. And, you know, where else would we be getting that? We have an inner knowing that connects with the whole universe, either for where we were before uh, incarnated or what we're connected with, that says, hey, this is wrong. We should not be dumping pollutions into the oceans. We should not be treating children that way. Um, we should be caring for all the people, the elderly people and the poor. You know, we're we're getting that from somewhere, but I know we're not getting that straight from society's values right now because generally speaking, society's values are not there. But if there's many, many of us getting that input is, I think, the, what I call the experiencer's path. We're literally making those changes just at least by noticing the problem first. And then, you know, when that awake, you know, now that I'm awake, now what feeling, you know? Um, then you feel overwhelmed because it's like, you know, what do I do now? But, I mean, pick something. What's right in front of you? What can, what's, like, accessible with your own hands and your own mind to resolve? You know, do that, okay? Address mm-hmm. that. So that, it, you know, this, as far as I know, you know, I was told by one being, there is no was, there only is, meaning that the Star Trek reality exists somewhere right now. Mm-hmm. I think we have a secret space program that has all the toys right now. But for some reason, uh, uh, Richard Dolan and, and others have said it's a breakaway civilization. It hasn't broken away enough because it's required an awful lot of resources down here from Earth. So someday, I believe, they're going to have to tell us and they're going to have to share. And they're going to have to let us have the same um, benefits worldwide that some few are experiencing now. Because this is, is the future. It's the right now. So I'll end with that, and uh, it's a great talk again with you, Janet. I love this topic <laughs> so much. Well, thank you. Yes, and I want to wish you a Star Trek anniversary, and please do celebrate it in some way. Go to a convention, uh, binge watch the show, uh, you know, tweet and uh, post and have Star Trek parties and wear your costumes this year and Halloween. However you can, do honor this reality, this Star Trekian history, which is now our now and our future, uh, by all these people for the last 50 years who have come and gone from this planet, literally, uh, and contributed their life this vision, this utopia, that each and every being alive and yet to come can experience and enjoy existence in 3D reality in some kind of form where we can all play with each other and love each other and share and grow, evolve and expand and become, which we've always been waiting for. All right, I think that's enough for today. Thank you very much, and Brett, and uh, do join us again tomorrow. Uh, Kara, one last word. Who's our guest tomorrow? Uh, Corey LeBoy, he's an experiencer. Brett and I have gotten to know, and you guys will get to know him. He's really awesome. And, again, another person on the experiencer path. Wonderful. And if you are an experiencer, please do contact us at AquarianRadio at gmail.com. We'd love to interview you on one of our future shows. All right, I think that's it for today. So much love and blessings and aloha to everyone.
Welcome to the Total Wireless Store, where total confidence awaits. My wife loves when I DJ our car rides, but overages get in the way of my groove. Don't worry. You got this with Total Wireless. Right now, get 50% more data when you bring your number to any qualifying service plan starting at $35. All in the nation's best 4G LTE network. Wiki, wiki, 50% more. Now go find that perfect DJ name. New York. Discover the Total Wireless stores and get total confidence. The latest phones, the best network, all at great prices. Ends January 2nd, 2019. $35 plans enough. Excludes ports from Trackphone Wireless Inc. brands. Turns at TotalWireless.com.